A warm welcome to our virtual seminar this year at EAAP. Unfortunately, COVID-19 travel restrictions have defeated us and we've been unable to be on site at the conference this year, but it's great to be able to host you virtually today. My name is Nick Brain. I'm a member of the Europe, Middle East and Africa marketing team. And it's my pleasure to introduce you to Thermo Fisher Scientific and to introduce our guest presenter in a moment. Firstly, Thermo Fisher Scientific is a, a large, diverse organization, and we know from customers it can be sometimes difficult to understand truly what we do and who we are. And so I wanted to provide a little bit of context to explain why we're here at EAAP. Thermo Fisher is actually a leader in serving science. We have over 80,000 colleagues globally, and over 5,500 of those are research and development scientists and engineers. They're powering programs developing the next generation of technologies, solutions, and products to power your science. And to achieve that, Thermo Fisher is investing over a billion US dollars in its research and development in 2021. To make that level of investment, of course, our revenue targets are ambitious at over 30 billion US dollars this year, but that makes us a large, stable and robust company and partner for your work, even in the very trying times that we're all experiencing today. Many of us at Thermo Fisher Scientific are ex-scientists ourselves, and we all are really proud of our mission, which is to enable our customers to make the world healthier, cleaner, and safer. For agrigenomics, we're really focused in on applied biosystems, which is the umbrella for all of our genetic analysis technologies, as well as sample collection and preparation solutions under our Invitrogen and Thermo Scientific brands. If we focus in on the genetic analysis right now, we have four main technology platforms within our agrigenomics uh, portfolio under the Applied Biosystems brand. We have next generation sequencing, microarray platform, quantitative PCR, and capillary electrophoresis sequencing and fragment analysis. This allows us to offer solutions from GWAS discovery and millions of markers through genomic selection, genomic prediction, to marker-assisted selection or breeding, parentage applications, and quality control. So we're really able to serve across the spectrum from millions of genetic markers, all the way down to just one genetic marker, if that's what you need. Today, our focus is the micro technology. And so let me just introduce you to that briefly before I introduce our speaker. Our microarray platform in agrigenomics is the Applied Biosystems Axiom genotyping solution. The microarrays themselves are formatted on array plates that you see on the left of this slide here. And we have different formats of those plates for 24 samples, 96 samples, or 384 samples. All of those formats run on the Gene Titan instrument that you see in the background of the graphic. When we combine that technology platform with the capability of our team in-house, we are able to offer a really flexible, scalable, and predictable solution for agrigenomics. It's flexible because we can design arrays to any species, genome size, and ploidy, and indeed we do on a regular basis. The scalability comes from both the different array plate formats that I mentioned, as well as the opportunity to design arrays across a wide range of marker densities, from just a few hundred markers on a multi-species array to genome-wide scale with hundreds of thousands of markers. And the predictability comes from the fact that in agrigenomics, which is really a biomarker-driven 
set of applications, we are able to design markers onto the array and know that when we manufacture those arrays, the markers will all be present. We do not suffer random marker loss during manufacturing, as can be experienced with other chip technologies. This enables us to design and offer a wide portfolio of catalog microarrays across many species important in the agricultural industry, including different breeds of cattle, pigs, sheep, goats, chickens, and many other species of animals besides. In addition to the catalog arrays, we have a real strength in custom array design. And there we have great expertise in house and a pipeline that enables this to be very fast and efficient. When a customer comes to us to work on a custom array, it's a dedicated bioinformatics partnership with our design team who will advise and work with that customer through the process. Multi-species designs are supported for customers that want to consolidate different programs onto one array solution. And the custom designs are available for low minimum orders. So for a whole genome high density array, for example, as few as 480 samples is sufficient to go ahead with a custom design. And once the design is locked down and finalized, we are able to manufacture and deliver very quickly within six to eight weeks. It's custom microarray design that our guest speaker is going to focus on today. And it's my real pleasure to introduce him now. Guilherme Nerman is a PhD candidate in the field of genetics in the group of Professor Gudrun Brockman at Humboldt University of Berlin. He has a master in informatics and a bachelor degree in biology, both from the Pontifical Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. His main interests are related to bioinformatics, computational genomics and conservation biology. And today he will speak to us about some of the work contributing to his PhD thesis in Professor Brockman's group. He's going to tell us about the content and design of the DSN200K SNP array, which is a new tool to assist genetic diversity management in an endangered German cattle population. Thank you, Guilherme. Hello, everyone. My name is Guilherme Neumann and I'm a PhD student at Humboldt University of Berlin in Germany. And today I'm going to present a part of my PhD thesis, which is entitled Content and Design of the DSN200K SNP chip a new tool to assist genetic diversity management in an endangered German cattle population. This is a project done in partnership with the University of Gießen, also in Germany. And the main idea today is that I present some insights and technical information on how we designed our customized SNP chip. So I'm very glad to be here. I'd like to thank Tamo Fischer for this invitation and also thank you for the interest on hearing from me. So very brief description on the ASN. So the ASN is just a shortcut for the actual name in German, Deutsches Schwarzbuntes Nides Rundrind. So in a free translation to English, it's German Black Pied. It's a boss Taurus dual purpose breed, which means we use it for both milk and beef. And it's a black and white coat, genetically horned, as you can see. And it's considered the ancestral population of hosting cattle. So those are animals from the North Sea region, which were exported uh, mainly to the US and where they were used for very specific breeding programs, generating then hosting. So nowadays we have DSN producing from 7,000 to 8,000 kilograms of milk per lactation, which is about 2,000 kilo kilograms less than hosting. And because of this, DSN has been largely replaced by the hosting cows in the last years, generating a current population size of about 2,500 animals. And for that reason, because of the small population size, this is classified as an endangered breed according to the Society for the Conservation of Old and Endangered Livestock Breeds. So it is also a official gene reserve um, subsided by the German government. So the idea is to keep DSN 
as a gene reserve, as a pool of genes that could be used for genetically rescued in hosting in the future if needed, for example. And it's also a way to conserve genetic diversity in both targos as a whole. So, um, so far, what we have been uh, able to do is that we detected some variants and candidate genes in some important traits for DSN. Those are milk, and mastitis resistance, and endoparasite infectious resistance. Those are mainly traits which are important in a context of having DSN inside organic farm. And also, um, we were able to develop an economic life net, lifetime net merit for DSN, which enables us to which makes us able to evaluate the, the value of, the, of DSN in an economic context. We also were able to impute the, or to test strategies for imputation in small populations, such as DSN, which is quite tricky when you don't have a, a huge reference panel. The only source of genetic information that we have been using into the moment is the Illumina SNP50. So what we normally call the Illumina 50K and how I'm going to call it here today. And from the 54K variants that we have, normally after a call rate and manual frequency filtering, we only have about 6.9K in the SN for more than 2000 animals. So for that reason, we, we lost some information and we also miss important information regarding functional variants, and we have a shortage of DSN typical variants. And of course, an absence of rare variants, so variants which are in a lower frequency. For that reason, we realized that we had a gap when thinking about the application of uh, conserving DSN and as having a gene reserve. So it might be enough for certain applications, but when we talk about the gene reserve, we are actually talking about genetic diversity management, and ultimately at maintaining heterozygosity. So our main goal is to maintain heterozygosity, which ameliorates inbreeding depression and loss of genetic variation at low side that may become of importance in the future. So it, it may become, right? So uh, this is the idea of conservation. It's a unknown future, a no trades, um, and that's the beauty of it. <laughs> And it can actually conservate post targos throughout those local breeds, but how really being aware of those low side that we don't know yet. And also we are we could be able to avoid genetic drift, which prevents deleterious recessives. So for example, rare diseases, alleles uh, from drifting to a higher frequency and also prevents random drift of important functional traits. So with that in mind, um, we, desi we decided to customize a SNP chip for DSN. So considering both uh, whole genome sequencing variants and Illumina variants. So it means all those 36K variants that we had, we decided to keep using those, but adding variants that might be interesting. And those are DSN typical variants, functional variants, diverse findings and differences between DSN and host team. With that, then we, you would be able to, re to approach more effective genome-wide association studies and work with market system selection, even though it's tricky because of the population size, and also work with genetic diversity management, our main goal, with mating suggestion, parent phrase control, and so on. So what we needed first was a initial data set of variants that we would have in DSN over the genome. So we decided to sequence 304 DSN animals. Those were systematically, systematically selected. All uh, insemination bulls that we had, which are 47 and 257 cows, those were sequenced in the Illumina NovaSec. And we processed all this data according to the guidelines given by 1000 bulls genome project. And also the filtering was done according to 1000 bulls where you work with the variant recalibration with the machine learning approach done uh, in, on the GATK software. So afterwards, we had a list of 20 million high quality variants. Those were 18 million SNPs and 2 million indels. And that's interesting to uh, remember here that 
from this time on, we are working both with SNPs and Indels. Afterwards, we also defined haplotype blocks. So of course, we couldn't work with just 20 million variants. So it would be nice to have a uh, genetic distance, the understanding of those variants. So for that reason, we defined the haplotype blocks in Blink, and those were 186K. So at this point, we had to decide, of course, which platform we were going to use. That's why I am here, because we decided to use the Axiom Mind Design from Time of Feature. This is a very personal decision, of course, and especially the size of the SNP chip. It depends on how many animals you have available for uh, genotyping and how many markers you want. So the more markers you have, the cheaper it gets. So yeah, I'm not going to discuss it here. What I can say is that the one that we uh, selected has about 96 samples per ship and it's up to 200K probe sets. So what you need to know is that what you give to Tama Fisher is a forward strand. So you give a sequence of seven to one bases where you have in the middle your variant, so the variation. And yeah, Tam Officer will tell you how likely, how likely it is that this probe is gonna work at the end. And even not only for the forward stand, but also for the reverse trend. And what you need to know as well is that sometimes when you have DCs and ATs variants, then you might need uh, two probe sets per marker, which is a technical um, aspect of Tam Officer uh, technology. So at this point, you might wonder, okay, but probably how long it takes, it would take years or, or whatever. And actually, this is how long it took to our case. For us, what took the most was the whole genome sequencing. This is, of course, the most time consuming part. For us, it was about four months. And yeah, we had 300 animals, but it depends if you have your data or not. And the array design took about three months, but it could actually have taken less. It depends on how clear is your criteria and how aware you are of what you want. So just to have to give you a brief understanding of how you interact with Tama Fisher. So uh, you have a first meeting with them where they, you discuss uh, the marks, market selection strategies. So they tell you what you should uh, keep in mind and what is just advisable to do. And you agree on a list of variants that they are going to proceed with in silic scoring. So this in silic scoring is a machine learning algorithm that they have on their own. And it's based on their database and also on, on their aspects. And they tell you uh, how, how likely it is that this variant is going to work at the end. And then they also uh, advise you on very specific topics that is important to your work. And in our case, they helped us with the uh, decision about the parentage panels and also with mitochondria because we wanted to have as many variants uh, from mitochondria as possible. And so they gave us all variants that they have in their database for mitochondria. And also they advise you at the end as this last um, step how many probe sets you should have per marker. As I said, ATs and DCs, you normally have two, but uh, in some cases for important, um, important variants of yours, you may say, no, I want to have also two or even more, and they help you with this decision. And as soon as your SNP chip is done, the design is finished. So of course you go for genotyping, and then they also help you with the development of the library files. Actually, they do this for you and you might ask them for some changes if you want. And then you use these library files in the Axion Analysis Suite, which is the software for the genotyping. So first things first, things first what we need to, to, to start doing is, of course, to reduce the number of variants that we have. So we had 20 million variants. So the first thing that you need to do is to remove all variants that are clustering with another variant in a neighborhood of, let's say, 30 base pairs. It means all variants which had another variant, uh, which is within 30 base pairs, should be removed. So this is what Tamo Fisher says. And in our case, since we have too many variants anyway, 
So we decided to remove everything within 35 base pairs, which means we would have at the end probe sets of 7 to 1 base pairs with only our target gene, uh, our target variant, nothing more. However, in, in the case we had like important variants of ours, that, like Jiva's results that we still wanted in the ship, so we allowed a clustering within uh, 20 base pairs. And yeah, Tam official says that for diploids organisms, it's still possible within 20 base pairs. So you can see this is the most crucial step regarding filtering. You, you lose most of your variants here. So in our case, we reduced the size for 8.9 million variants. And afterwards, we also had all the filtering uh, thresholds, like the coverage, we removed everything with a lower, uh, a, a coverage lower than 3000 reads because we had 300 animals. So we would expect 10 reads per animal and also the allele frequencies. You may do it with minor allele frequency, here we use it alternative allele frequency and we removed everything which was less than 5%. However, when we had variants which were DSN unique, so variants that were only occurring in DSN and were not occurring in other breeds closely related to DSN from 1000 bull, so breeds that we had information, then those variants we kept, variants which were higher than 1% in allele frequency. So this was a risk that we took to have this lower frequency variants, but those are variants unique to DSM and also rare variants. So we wanted to, to have those if possible. And here it's important to say that we're only talking about variants filtering, so you're not selecting anything yet. So this list of 5.6 million variants was sent to Tama Fischer, uh, where they actually then do the in silico scoring. So based on forward and reverse trained, and tell you which is the best probe set to use per marker. And they give you a p-convert score, which is this a measurement of how likely the probe set will work at the end. And what they tell you is normally that everything um, greater than 0 0.6 in p-convert score is recommended. So we only work at here from now on with recommended variants. Those were 3.1 million variants. And then we finally, went to the selection of variants. First thing, we took everything which was most important to us. So all variants from the Illumina 50K, those were the 36K variants, all Jiva's results, all variants which were high, moderate or low impact predicted by VEP, variant effect predictor, all variants which were DSN unique and higher and had a higher difference between DSN and host time, and also all variants from the right chromosome, mitochondria, and the parentage panels. And we removed all variants from this group that were in complete LD, because then, of course, we want to reduce the, the number of variants selected. And afterwards, what we did, we, we selected all variants per haplotype block that were not covered yet in this first selection. And those were haplotype blocks longer than 1KB when they had a when they were inside a gene or close to a gene of 100 um, KB, and also all haplotype blocks longer than 5 KB, independently of having a gene or not. And for each um, haplotype, we took one marker, which were the one with the highest p-convert score and had a minor allele frequency greater than 5%. And if we had uh, variants with empirical data, which means that already we, we had a proof that it worked before in, in other snipships from Tamo Fisher, then those markers will uh, prioritize it. Then we ended up with 182K um, and we finally selected manually 16 variants that were uh, filling gaps of 200KB. So you can see here we have three main points. First is biological relevance, then the genetic distance uh, by haplotype block, blocks, and then the physical distance. And at the end, we have uh, a SNP chip with 182K uh, tiled, which were from 103,000 uh, haplotype blocks. So here you can see the number of uh, markers per, uh, per category of selection, those bio of biological relevance. So you can see 34K from the Illumina 50K 
and 1,000 from Jiva's results, 50K from high, moderate, and low impact. So we have basically a 50K SNP chip only with functional variants. And we have 38K from DSN Unique, 55 with a high difference between DSN and hosting, 321 from Y chromosome, 272 from mitochondria, and 554 all markers from the ICAR and Isaac parentage panels, and then 58 from the haplotype blocks, and, 15, and 16 from gap filling. And those sum up if you remove the overlaps between those variants to this 182,154 variants. So of course, here you have uh, some overlaps between, for example, high, moderate, and low impact variants to the Illumina 50K or to GVAS, right? But those are the numbers which are more important to us. And you may ask, wh what about the 200K? Because this is a 200K SNP chip. And actually it sums up to 203K probe sets because then we have the GCs and AT variants. And also in some categories, for example, those variants from GVAS, we also um, included them twice in the ship. So here you can have an idea of the physical distance. So the distance between tiled uh, variants in the ship. And you can see we only had a long gap. The longest gap was in chromosome 10, which was about 1 MB. And another one, which was longer than 200 KB in the chromosome 12. Those were regions which re really did not have any uh, variants detected in DSN. And we also have some gaps or a lot of gaps in the Y chromosome, but this was because of a problem in the sequencing where we believe it is a pseudo autosomal region in the Y chromosome where we had a problem in the mapping. But the Y chromosome was just something uh, that we wanted to have, but was not priority because both the Y chromosome and the mitochondria, they are not included in the reference genome of the uh, in the cattle genome, and then that's the, the problem that you might find. So here you can see how we were able to increase the number of functional variants in our SNP chip in comparison to Illumina 50K. That was one of our main goals. So from in blue, you, those are the um, lowest uh, impact variants, and in, in red, the highest impact variants. So you can see we were able to increase, for example, missense variance to 9% in DSN and in, in comparison to bovine uh, 50K where those are mostly intragenic and intronic variants. Of course, their selection probably had in mind to keep neutral variants, but we wanted to have those functional variants as well. So at the end, just very briefly, how we have been used the SNP chip. So far, we genotyped about 1,594 DSN animals, and those were 167K variants which successfully called. So this is about 91%, where of 86% is segregating DSN at a minor allele frequency greater than 1%. So this calling here, it's not only the calling itself, technically speaking, but it considers also the genotype clustering done by the software and also the, all the filtering that you do. We use it all the default thresholds by Temu Fischer, and we also check the, the quality per marker. So yeah, we may ask, okay, is this nine to one good or not? It depends on what you wanted. So in our case, we took the risk to have variants that were not calling or even not segregating. And when we look at this table here, we can see the failing variants. They are mainly from the street groups, the high, moderate, and low impact, DSN unique and haplotype block. And we believe the main reason is actually the allele frequencies, which makes sense. If you look at the minor allele frequency from the sequencing data, we see it's quite low. So in DSN unique, it is really low. So it's about 0 0.03. And in the other two groups, it is not so low, but you, if you look at the standard deviation, you can see that some variants, they are actually very low in frequency. And also when we look at the B-convert score, those are always greater than 0 0.6, but they are more or less uh, close to 0 0.6 
And when we look at this uh, distribution here of the cold variants, we can see that the failing, they are between 0 0.6 and 0 0.8. Yeah, however, also the, the ones which are working are also between 0 0.6 and 0 0.8 mainly. So this is not the only reason, probably there are a lot of other reasons behind and we believe it's mainly because of the allele frequency, like I said, and also the sequencing uh, quality. So we were not so conservative because we wanted to keep as many very important variants as possible. And this is depend on you if you are uh, uh, open to lose some variants, otherwise you should be more conservative about this. But if you want to know a little bit more about the performance of the zip chip, this is not the main idea here, you can check out my presentation in session 46, and this is the abstract number, so I believe it's going to be recorded somewhere in the EAP website. Um, so to conclude, we are very glad that we were able to develop a customized SNP chip for DSN, included very important functional variants. This is a very flexible and diverse selection of variants. And it was not very time consuming, it was a very straightforward solution. Of course, there might be other solutions for genetic diversity management, well, but we believe that this is one of the most cost-effective solutions. And the most interesting thing about it is that we are able now to update the failing variants. So we could, for example, take 10k variants from the stem chip, which are not so nicely working, and just replace those with variants with a stricter manual frequency and quality control thresholds. So that's the nice thing about it. And uh, I hope you enjoyed and you learned something that it might help you with your design. Of course, I'm able for questions. And I would like to thank uh, the DSN breeders and RBB for supporting us with data and material for, from DSN animals, and also Tamo Fisher for the invitation today, and also from the support given during all the design of the SNP chip. And also thank the, of course, the funding from the Federal Ministry of Food and Agriculture of the German government. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gilliam, for a great talk. Unfortunately, a recording error during the live EAAP workshop prevents us from bringing the Q&A session to you on this on-demand stream. Our apologies for that, but let's return to the workshop now. If you would like to learn more about how we can support your success in agrigenomics at Thermo Fisher Scientific, you really have two choices. You can join us at our virtual booth at the EAAP Virtual Expo. There you'll find some really great short interview videos with our customers, as well as, of course, information about our agrigenomic solutions. You can also visit our website at thermofisher.com forward slash agrigenomics, where there are many more case studies, recorded webinars, and of course, information about the solutions we can offer. There, you can also request further information from us via a form on the website. I'd also like to bring to your attention two developments in our microarray portfolio. The first is a new microarray for bovine, for cattle research, which will be launched in September this year. This is the new Axiom Bovine Genotyping 100K array. It'll be made available in our high throughput 384 sample format, as well as our mid throughput 96 sample format. The array has been designed with collaborators to support applications such as dairy genetic evaluation, parentage analysis, and genomic and trait selection. On that last application, the content of course therefore includes very important markers that are trait specific for that research. You can see on the right of the slide some of the sources of content that the team have collated to form this 100,000 marker array. If you'd like more information about this and to be alerted when it launches, please fill in our web form at thermofisher.com forward slash agrigenomics and we'll be happy to let you know once the array is available. And then the second update is for the pig breeding world. 
We are now in the process of designing a new pig breeders array on the Axiom technology platform. And here we're asking for collaborators to help to design the content. If you have markers in pig breeding that you feel are very important to include on this type of agrogenomic tool, then please get involved. You can contact us quite easily to suggest markers that you would like included to really ensure that this array contains the content most useful to the pig breeding community. The array is going to be designed with commercial breeds in mind, but also wild European boars. And for applications such as trait marker association, genomic selection, parentage, and specifically host genetic infection research. So for example, the array will contain markers for African swine fever and PRRS. If you would like to get involved at whatever level, it's very simple to do this. Please just email our bioinformatics team here in Europe at bfxemea at thermofisher.com and they'll be happy to respond to you to understand how you'd like to contribute. Closing date for design input is Friday the 15th of October 2021 and the design will be finalised and available by the end of this year. That leaves me with one last thing to do, which is the thank yous for this virtual workshop. First of all, a warm thank you to Guilherme Neumann for his really great talk about why he chose to make a custom microarray and his experience working with the team at Thermo Fisher Scientific. Secondly, thank you to you for your interest and for attending this virtual workshop. And finally, of course, to the EAAP organisers for giving us the opportunity to share this with you. If you'd like to learn more, please visit our virtual expo booth or our website. And we really hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Goodbye.